Yeah, opening the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors for June 5th. Uh, looks like it's 631-ish. Um, uh, first order of business, I uh, just want to clarify there is a um, specific ask to ensure that, that as part of our separate board planning, retreat or retreat planning, uh, we had a quick update from Libby on kind of the past year at the legislature and um, what sort of engagement the district has had. Uh, uh, so the first order of public comment. Uh, public comment is when we uh, take feedback from the public. Uh, it's, it's an open, we slot five minutes for it, but if it takes longer, it takes longer. Um, we do not respond in real time to public comment. That does not mean that we are not listening and, and not taking uh, the feedback very seriously. Um, this is uh, very important for our decision-making process. Uh, we try to make sure the concerns brought to us are uh, addressed, and um, certainly the input is very valuable for um, our knowledge of what is concerning people, and also we, we learn quite a bit from the public comment. So, it's a very important part of the the meeting, but again, we don't respond in real time. Um, I don't see any um, one in the audience who is not already presenting or supporting people who are presenting. Uh, so let's see if there's anyone online who would like to make public comment. Carlin, but she's often here. It doesn't. Was that Carlin's online? But I don't see yeah. her raising her hand. All right. Uh, so no public comment. Uh, next item is the consent agenda, um, which is uh, basically uh, pro forma things like approval of minutes and the approval of our uh, warrant for payroll um, uh, and uh, agendas for super meeting for next meetings, et cetera. Um, it's a way for us to do a lot of things quickly. Uh, and if there's an item that anyone uh, has questions about or feels need further discussion, they can pull it from the consent agenda. Um, before I ask for a motion, I did notice that the uh, yeah, thanks, 2004, thanks for 2005. Nudge. We we made the meeting dates today. Anna made the meeting dates yes, today. Yes, but if you look at the heading years, it's a year off. The 2003 meetings. Oh, she yes. just cut and okay. pasted. Okay, yeah. thanks. That's a good. Okay. She'll fix it. She's probably fixed it already. Not, not a huge right. one. Yeah, yeah it is that's right. We'll yeah. fix it up before it goes um, on that page. Pick it up. <laughs> is it? Online is. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I printed this off this afternoon. Ahead. So, good job, Hannah. Uh, uh, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Any questions? I just have a question for you, Libby. In your superintendent's report, you in referencing the yield bill, you said the govern I think the governor's office is interested in adjusting the adequacy formula. I don't know what that is. And I feel like I followed school financing pretty closely this year. Is that a new thing or is that well it's an old thing and it's in other states. So okay. That's what the legislature is currently wrangling over in terms of how to change school finance. So oh. basically we'll be paying attention to that in future years. Mm -hmm. um, this is the thing where every district gets what the state deems to be adequate. Yes. And then if we wanted to fund higher than that, it would come from that like is more the, complicated. That than is the I most understand. basic understanding. Yeah. Of it. Okay. Yeah. That's so a that's good understanding what, for us to have right now. Yeah. And that's where adequacy comes from. Yes. Adequacy for Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thanks for the clarification. Uh, any other questions or comments about the consent agenda? Um, before we move on, let's just welcome formally Amani. I don't know if you're actually formally serving yet, but or just sitting in, but um, <laughs> great. So uh, yeah, no, fantastic and great to. Great to have you. Welcome aboard. Uh, when do you officially start? Is it after the sometime? I, sometime we, soon? we appointed her, so, so I invited her. Excellent. Um, well, I can officially start now. <laughs> unless, unless, unless you can. Uh, All the pop and service. 
Exactly. Uh, yeah, well, welcome aboard. We're really excited to, to have you uh, join us. Um, I think I think she's going to be here the 19th. Yeah, you come and take that. Yeah, yes. great. Then I'm Yeah. Then it'll be a special. Yes. Uh, and you'll have already graduated at that yeah. point? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, excellent. Uh, let's move on to our update on literacy, uh, professional learning, and we're um, we have uh, very happy to have Rachel Allen and MC Reed join us. So, uh, yeah, we're also happy Mike Berry's here too, and Mike as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we did not vote on the consent agenda. Oh, before we did that, all those in favor. Hi. Any opposed? Good. Uh, good reminder. I was like, either I just forgot something big or. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, actually, then, Jim, before they start, can I make just a quick announcement from the Superintendent Evaluation Committee just to let the board know that the teacher and staff climate survey is out? And um, staff will have a couple of weeks to fill it out, and then board members should look soon. We'll send you an email with Libby's evaluation form soon and the um, like within the next week or two and the committee will have a timeline attached to that so that you'll know when we need it back from you bye just want to let everybody know mostly as an fyi but also pay attention to your inbox not that you don't already hey no <laughs> you. Me, yeah so for those board members who don't know these two wonderful individuals who I'd love to clone, Rachel Whalen is technically on paper a reading interventionist at Union Elementary School um, and part of UES's guiding coalition, so teacher leadership team. She is now pitch hitting for a kindergarten teacher again. She yeah. tried to get out of the kindergarten classroom and we just wouldn't let her. Um, so she's working in a kindergarten classroom right now, but will return next year to reading intervention. And MC Reed is a marvelous second grade teacher. Are you on the Guiding Coalition? No, no, Rachel you're not. This year. I'm on PBIS and some other things. So everything else. Yeah. So MC works in our second grade and is just simply amazing. And Rachel had field day today. MC missed field day today, so she's fresh as a daisy. So if, <laughs> if Rachel just points to MC, then we know that she's yeah. tired from yeah. today. No. Well. You know, I can think of worse company. So, <laughs> um, so thank you so much for having us tonight. Uh, we're excited to be here to update you on the amazing professional development opportunity we've had at Union Elementary School and Roxbury Village School this year. And so um, that uh, professional development opportunity is called Letters, and so I want to just start by giving a little background on why we chose Letters as a district. And so Letters is uh, kind of uh, answered some of the questions we were looking for when we were looking for professional development. We're looking for something that was really comprehensive and ongoing. Um, we had a wonderful professional development opportunity at UES years ago with um, Christian Cordemanche, who led us through some really wonderful math training. And what teachers gave us for feedback was what worked about that was that it continued. It was ongoing. It cycled. It circled around. And so we always felt like it was just, mm -hmm. we had opportunities to answer the questions that came up along the way. So we wanted something that mirrored that for literacy. We wanted something that focused on explicit instruction, especially of foundational literacy skills. And we wanted it to be something that teachers could immediately take into the classroom, interventionists, multilingual educators, special educators, and put to work right away. And so Mike and Katie and Libby and all of those people who make the decisions met with letters and that checked all of those boxes. And so we began doing that this year. Uh, one of the things that's really great about letters is letters will, the letters trainers will say this again and again, they're program agnostic. They're not a literacy program. They are a, an opportunity for you to build your instructional practice. And so, um, 
that is another thing that we learned as we started the training and was very appealing to everybody right away, no matter what programs or resources or tools we bring into um, UES or any of our schools in the future, the training from letters can benefit us regardless. So, um, and so I'll talk a little bit about what it looks like yeah. and then Mary Cat will kind of go a little bit deeper into that. So this right now is a two year commitment. We've been doing this, um, all of our literacy educators have been doing this for the entirety of this school year. We will continue on into next school year. We've had um, the opportunity to do the first three units this year. So they were the challenge of learning to read, speech sounds of English, and teaching beginning phonics, word recognition, and spelling. And so each unit has about eight sessions. And some of those sessions we do asynchronously at our Monday staff meeting time. But then some of those sessions we had the opportunity to work in person with letters trainers or virtually with letters trainers. And all of those trainers have just been amazing. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just speak to more how that looks like for us. Um, so on Mondays, um, my team of second graders, we meet together in one classroom and we project it and watch it and do the lesson together. And which is really great because we can pause, we have discussions, we have aha moments and we're like, and also are like, oh, we got to try this. And that's one of the big things is that we're immediately like, going and, and giving something a try and discussing discussing it. Um, so it's very collaborative, even, you know, as we're, it's this video and you're engaged with it, they have these like check for understandings and like the, actually every time when you finish a lesson, there's like a test. And so it's kind of funny, like we all like take the test and you, you know, you submit it and then we're like, okay. And then we have this like discussion about like, oh, why did we you know, maybe get that problem wrong? And this and that we go, we have the manual and, and it just is this really great conversation. Um, and you'd think like we've been doing this since September, you'd think like uh, every Monday, but it is fantastic. Um, I, I mean that really. And it's so nice that we're all hearing the same thing. We're all on the same page. And what's happening for the second grade team is also happening. I, every team kind of meets like that. I know the special educators are meeting and um, Julie Smart and Jen's mm -hmm. written there all, and I see them all in there in their chairs doing the same kind of thing, watching it together and discussing it. So it's not like I'm in my room watching it on the computer. We're all really engaged with each other through this whole process, which also makes it even more enriching, um, I think, which is great. And Rachel pops in. Yep. <laughs> She's done, you've done your sessions and then yeah. she's like, I'm going to do it with you second grade today so we can talk. So that's been really neat. And it's really great. The conversations that we have about that. Um, there's also a part in it that's really unique too. It's called bridge to practice. And this is where you kind of like pick like some students in your room and you actually go and apply what you're doing and kind of like, like a case study. And you're like then kind of learning more too. So that's been really neat to, um, to do that reflective piece also and like actually you know, take it you try it you're like and then so that's been really uh, a neat part of that yeah and also want to add that some of our staff members are actually taking this for credit and so they're earning either relationship credit or college credit for this and um and just the other day one of Mary Cat's colleagues was saying like I can't believe I'm earning credit for this it's just amazing it's yeah. such a great opportunity so yeah, yeah. absolutely um so in in terms of what has changed at UES this year that has been influenced by letters, um, one of the things that letters really hones in on is the importance of that early phonological awareness education. And so um, kind of what's been happening at the same time running on a parallel track is we did an overhaul of our literacy curriculum and really worked on getting our practice and our content aligned uh, vertically and also across grade level. And so one of the things that we brought in this year was um, the Hegarty Phonological Awareness Program. And that went into our K and one classrooms and has been just an amazing um, opportunity for our teachers and our students and sitting here at the end of a kindergarten year. Um, it's really exciting to see uh, to see how much the kids have learned and also having been in the kindergarten classroom before um, kids were always learning, but kids are learning um, 
that phonological awareness skills in a deeper and more meaningful way. And they've really internalized that. And it's uh, just so exciting to see, really excited to see the data come back on that. Um, Can you please explain what Hegarty is? Yeah, so Hegarty is a daily phonological awareness program. So phonological awareness is working on skills like rhyming, um, syllabication, so breaking words into syllables and segment or in blending syllables together. And then throughout the course of the kindergarten year, it goes more in into taking words and listening for like first sound, medial sound, final sound, um, substituting those sounds, deleting them, adding them. And so it's just basically, it's like, we used to call it word play. <laughs> like you just are playing with words, you're breaking them apart, you're putting the pieces together. And so um, it takes about, I would say like, it's like a 10 minute burst of instruction. Um, it's whole class and it's very routine. So it's like we do these five activities. Um, there's a kinesthetic piece, lots of hand signals that go along with it. And um, and it was something that at first was definitely like a learning curve for staff and kids. But now when you go into classrooms, like kids, kids are not just doing it with teachers. Like when we're assessing kids, they're using the hand motions that they do in Hegarty to think about how they're breaking apart words. So it's very, very um, exciting to see. Uh, the other thing that I feel like has been influenced by letters and something that we were already wanting to do already is increasing our use of decodable text for our early readers, um, because we know that those are the types of texts that help them to learn best when they're building, when they're doing that learning to read part before they get to the reading to learn part in the upper grades. That's been great. Um, some of the other things that I want to talk about with like these programs like Hegarty Foundation mm -hmm. is also letters is putting us all on like universal, like we're all using this universal language. So K, one, two, and on, we're hearing these same things, whether you are in, you know, a special ed teacher, a multilingual teacher, a classroom teacher, we're all using the similar um, like alphabet sounds so that when you come from kindergarten, you hear it again first grade and you hear it again second grade and you see those symbols and it just drills in there and becomes like part of you. And like, even like the kinesthetic learning, like I've always, you know, like E, edge, E, eh, or A, apple, at, and you'd be surprised that the kids read and they'll be like, you know, and that's, it's so part of that is important. And so one of the good things also about letters is that we have all come together where it's not like, oh, I might've known this from my previous years and some, and now we're all on the same page. And so that way everyone's getting that very um, succinct and um, important tier one instruction, or also then it lends into other tier instructions, which is really cool. And that we're all on the same page, talking the same language when we get together to um, talk about children and their learning and their reading and where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I think another important thing too is like the emphasis is on what's changed and not what's new. Like these pieces have always existed within our classrooms, but what, what this opportunity this year of, you know, re-examining our literacy curriculum and bringing letters into our school into both of our UES and RVS schools is what it's done is like Mary Kat said, is bringing us together and giving us common language. It's giving us a common experience that we mm -hmm. can all share in and reflect on. And so that is new and it's changed our instruction, but those pieces of our instruction were already there to be improved upon, which is really, um, I think that's yeah. part of what's been that, beneficial. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were also, we've been talking about, you know, you and I had a we had an overlap this year of a student when you were working in um, the tier two, tier yeah. three supports. Yeah. And it was great. You came back with like, wow, it's working, Mary, because he's already you know, like advanced on. He's talking about stuff that I was doing in at this group. And then he was going back with you doing more refined work. But it was mm -hmm. just really neat that that's what I mean by that crossover connection. And that just like so that it's great. You're hearing at the tier one and then you're getting drilled more if you need it at like a tier two, tier three level. And it, and that's really great. So it's not a different thing. It's, it's great. Yeah. Just so more because the, we don't want that first instruction to be happening at tier two and tier three, that first instruction is happening in the classroom with our general ed classroom teachers. And then when they come to work either at a tier two group mm -hmm. with their classroom teacher, or they come to the intervention space to work with us, 
you know, I can work on um, with third graders decoding multisyllabic words, but I don't have to explain what a syllable is. And I don't have to explain what an open and a closed syllable is because that great instruction <laughs> has already happened in their second and third grade classrooms. And so it allows me, like Mary Kat said, to just go deeper with that instruction and Jennifer as well. So yeah, yeah that was um, so in the slideshow, I put a couple of quotes from some of our UES educators. Um, Mary Kat and I are here kind of in that classroom teacher hat, but I also wanted to share some quotes from uh, one of our special educators, one of our multilingual educators, and also one of our uh, reading interventionists. And so while we're not going to read these to you, we just want to highlight a little, um, kind of what we be believe are the big takeaways from what they had to share. Um, I think down here at the bottom, we were talking about the that it ensures that um, seamless um, ensures that seamless transition for students between special educators and the process through grade levels, and that's just what I was just previously kind of talking about. And particularly, you know, um, Jen's a special educator. I work right down the hall. We and we're we're so into this that we're talking about it all the time too. You know, like we, you know, when there's something you're like, oh, maybe we should try this. And, mm -hmm. and which is great. And it goes back to that, that we're all this united team together presenting this stuff and trying things and I can go and, and get these things. So I think that's been awesome. You know, really, a really great part of this experience is that like seamless going in and that we're all hearing the same thing and we're helping each other and adding, adding to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then one of the things I wanted to really highlight about, uh, so this quote's from Jennifer Griffith, who's my literacy intervention partner. Um, Jennifer talks about like the increase in curiosity. And when Mary Kat and I were talking the other day, I feel like the two things we've really seen is this increase in curiosity and also this increased critical eye of our educators. I feel like now when we have a program or an assessment or um, a material resource in front of us, letters training has given us this critical eye where we can look at that and we can figure out, okay, what are the key elements of this? What needs to come into the classroom? What's maybe a negotiable? Um, and that piece too about the curiosity, um, I was talking about this with my K teammates the other day is our conversations just in the last year have shifted from that like frustration of like, oh, this, this kid, <laughs> like, I don't know how to help this kid to why is, why is my instruction not meeting the student's needs? What else can I be doing? And it's feeling like the onus is going more onto us as educators and what we can do. And it's like, it's like a good problem to solve and not like a crisis that we're in. And so I feel like that curiosity has also allowed us to just support our students better yeah. because we're coming at it from, right. from and, that angle. And because of the great background we've learned with letters, you know, we're saying to each other, well, are they, are they missing? Is it the syllable that, you know, like we're really getting, getting more deeper about like where, you know, like we're talking to each other on this level of like, where is it falling off? Like, and then we've learned all these new, like little mini assessments that we can be like just really more target that which has been really great um i think we're going to talk later but just like you know some of the the the, the valley the vowel valley yeah. and like just these different things of like articulation your mouth i mean i'm learning some incredibly new things that i was like you know is very helpful yeah. and when you're talking to children just about your mouth and sounds and how they um, mm -hmm. come out. It's just been great. And that's part of that discussion, right? We said, oh, well, how was this? Have we tried this? And yeah, yeah, it's been great. And also just going to what I was talking about before about how letters is program agnostic. Jennifer um, pulls a quote here from Louisa Motes, who's one of the um, uh, authors of the letters manual and talking about how programs are really helpful tools, but programs don't teach, teachers do. And Libby is a big believer in that as well. <laughs> um, and it is true. And that's what I was saying before. What letters is giving us is an opportunity to build our instructional practice. So no matter what classroom we're in, what materials are in front of us, where we go, that isn't going to change. That is always going to be something that us and our students benefit from. So I was really uh, grateful to Jennifer for pulling that quote out because I think it's a really important one for us to keep our eye on. Um. Oh, here's what I was going to talk about my little, with that. Um, this is a quote from um, Sylvia Fagan about, and she's a multilingual teacher. And 
this has been really great about what we've learned about articulation and sounds and syllables has really also strengthened how we like are delivering instruction to um, students who are, you know, are speaking different languages. And, <laughs> so, <loud. laughs> um, so that's been really interesting too. And like Sylvia taking that back and like, and learning all these things. And I feel like that also is enriching my instruction for all learners. And um, that's been really fantastic too. And I, I've just learned so much about like, my mouth and how you articulate words and the sounds and is it lips? Is it stop? Is it Africa? Is, I mean, it's just been amazing. And, you know, I remember years ago having a mirror and talking, but now I know even more depth about just the oral and how these sounds and how to help when it's like, when there's, there's a stock thing. And yeah. that's been really great. I feel like I'm now we'll get on the SLP to my little. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely been like a crash course in linguistics. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. I was like, I mean, there's some things that I've learned. I'm like, oh my god, I had no yeah. idea. We're all like, did you know that? I didn't know that. Like, yeah. and so that's like this amazing. Like, I mean, that's been really great. Yeah, for sure. And one of the things too that, um, from the multilingual standpoint, that letters has spent some time uh, digging into is how you know like how we learn uh, sounds in English versus how like specifically Spanish they talk about. So they talk about how in Spanish there's only five vowel sounds to learn. And then over in the English side of things, we have we got a whole vowel. <laughs> yeah, we've got, you know, upwards of like 14 different vowel sounds to learn. And so just understanding what that must be like for our students who are learning English as, you know, an additional language and, and being multilingual learners, understanding like like how, like all the listening they're having to do to differentiate between all those different that just vowel sounds that we're using. Um, and so we've really appreciated that. Um, and one of my teammates, uh, Sandra Carrillo, is um, a native Spanish speaker. And it was really fun doing those sessions with her because, you know, then we turn and Sandra would like, just basically validate everything that we're saying. She was like, yeah, it's very difficult. And, but it just gives us a perspective yeah. that we didn't have before. And I Absolutely. appreciate that so much. Yeah. That, that knowledge I've gained so much skills mm -hmm. from that. And, and that's like, that's where we break off and have these like conversations yeah. on Monday. And we're like, Oh no, you know, we go by four fifteen. I don't know how many times yeah. just because the conversation is like, rich and we're all like, oh, and then someone's like, I got to get kids, you know, as yeah. they, you know, but yeah. it's that kind of, you know, meaningful instruction. And in terms of those meaningful conversations too, I'm going to talk about your team for a minute. Okay. So I work with Mary Cat's team. Um, I'm their guiding coalition rep. And so I get to facilitate their meetings and work with them really closely. And um, throughout this year, we've also been implementing these teaching assessing cycles, which have allowed us to dig deeper into um, formative assessments that we do with our students. And um, uh, during our second literacy one this year, there was an opportunity, you know, we definitely wanted to look at students and how they were reading. And there was an opportunity to look at decoding, but teachers were actually feeling really confident with like, if kids aren't yet decoding, I know how to approach that. I know what the tools are. I know what kind of practice they need, but the question of fluency came up and that has, that is always kind of this, um, can be somewhat evasive <laughs> reading skill and how do you practice fluency and we we what we found ourselves with a, was a lot of that curiosity we we had a lot of questions mm -hmm. and instead of shying away from that we dove into that and we decided let's look at fluency let's look at how do we assess fluency how do we teach fluency and and that day after we made that decision, I feel like there was just a flurry of emails throughout the day as people were like, yeah. well, I found this article, I found this resource, let's put it all together. You guys we created a whole, a other... whole folder. Yep. And, and it was just this really amazing, rich opportunity. It was like action research on the ground. And it was super exciting to be a part of it and, um, and to watch your students all grow as yeah. a result of it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. and I feel like that is another one of those things that's come from this professional development opportunity. Yeah, so, that was yeah. really great. And, and that's just like, a, we've had similar discussions like that throughout the whole year during our literacy and being excited to like, try something new, we go assess, then we do our cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's just been really, um, yeah. it's just been really great. You know, it's, you get excited when you like, you know, I'm passionate about learning, not just teaching, but I'm also passionate about learning myself. 
And so it's exciting when you're in this and I'm learning something new and we're trying it and then you see its impact. Yeah. It just kind of, it fuels my tank. I mean, I get, my tank gets fueled often by lots of, you know, yeah. <laughs> little, little ones and smiles and things like that. And pictures of me with my glasses on my head now, cause it's my new symbol. But, um, <laughs> anyway, that's just really something I want to make. Yes. I love that learning in this yeah. year. I've been learning a lot. So yeah. it's been great. Yeah. And so kind of what's next for us um, here at UES and um, with our new colleagues from RVS, we will continue going through our letters training next year. Uh, we're going to dive into unit four, which is about advanced decoding, spelling, and word recognition. And so that'll be an opportunity for us to build our toolkit around yeah. fluency. Um, we are going to continue. We've been learning a lot about these great diagnostic tools um, as we've been going through letters. And so exploring some of those diagnostic tools at the tier two and tier three level to help us um, build these just I guess more in-depth profiles of our learners and why how they're learning and what they're learning and why. And then we'll just continue. I know we'll continue to implement all of that great instructional practice that we're learning about. Um, our most recent uh, session with a letters trainer mm -hmm. was all about how to run a literacy small group yes. and broke down all the components. And what I love about it is, I mean, if you ask any teacher, what are your favorite trainings? It's the one where you leave with something you can do the next day. And everybody, I feel like went back to their classroom the next day and implemented at least one, if not more of those activities. And it's so, Letters is so rich with these activities and having us try them out in real time yeah. and experience them the way that our learners might experience well, them. Yeah. Even when we got on those sessions, you're, you have to come with your whiteboard. You have yeah. to come with your like out uh, something to push up you they say yeah. like come prepared with these things and you do you sit there and you're practicing and which is really great and um you know those are the live sessions but mm -hmm. then we do the same thing when it's us we have it out and we practice it again and that's been really great yeah yeah so thank you thank you oh. yeah thank you that's, that's other... it is really good work yeah it's exciting work yeah yeah uh questions for <laughs> um, how do you how do you see this like sustaining right so it sounds like this is really good really intense it sounds amazing and I love the idea that it's not subject based it's like universal for all topics but like if after you know three four or five years is it like a train the trainer like how does it become sort of baked into yeah so um year? I'm actually going through the process this summer of becoming our like school's Lexia lead teacher and so we'll build our capacity in-house to continue um training new staff as they come on and on board and so yeah that has definitely been a part of the vision because this has been so good it's like you want to trap lightning in a bottle right and how do you keep it going so there's been a lot of thought about that moving forward yeah Okay. What was in place before and why, why did you gravitate toward the letters um, model? So I feel like before we had a lot of kind of... I think we had like, a lot of things in the, like, up in the air, but I don't, I think like when it came to like, like a spelling and like phonics work, that's where people, it was kind of a, a little bit all around. And so I think that that's one of the things that was really, that came out of this is having something that went that people were consistently doing K one, two, three, mm -hmm. up like that. Yeah. And like, be well, before you would have a lot of teachers going off and doing their going and investigating workshops kind of of their own accord or teams might go and do a workshop or a training together. And there's been opportunities offered within our district in the past. And so there was all these kind of piecemeal right. um, opportunities, which were all great, but this was an opportunity to do something that, like I said, was comprehensive and like ongoing and because that's how we learn and just wanting to do something that's like how students learn. Yeah. Well, I think even like as we got children up to second grade, we would see, you know, some of these holes and we're like, oh, you know, like, and so I think that this is what this has helped us do is, is kind of avoid some holes, right? Like that it's this distinct, it's going here and it's building on it rather than, and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I was doing some more foundation stuff still over the years. And I was like, oh, I wish they had that, you know, like, 
or I'd have to figure out, oh, they do heart words in first grade. And I do, I call it sight words here and helping us like that kind of thing. It, it seems funny, but when I come and I'm like, oh, okay, you've got these heart words and which ones have you learned? Those are like the sight words, you know, and then they're called, there's all these different things, but getting on so that's one language mm -hmm. is so much better, you know, and then that I know what this group has done and what that group has done. And then I pick up from that that kind of thing that everyone was doing and they were teaching these, you know, sight words or they were called heart mm -hmm. words or, but I think what's helped us is all get succinct, succinct like that. Yeah. Caring. Well, and, and they'll say this in letters over and over again too, is that it's not about one accepted scope and sequence. It's not about one accepted, you know, method for what you call sight words. It's about the consistency. It's about having a consistent scope and sequence we're using across the building. And I think before when we were doing, um, when we were kind of exploring trainings and workshops and professional development on our own, that's when we were coming together with lots of different options all very valid and great options, but letters has brought us together and given us that common language. Yeah. Where like someone might like, I really do it this way in my room. I like this way and I do it this way. And those are great ways, but it, it doesn't help kids when they go the next year and then they're mixed into a different classroom and they've had different experience, you know? And so you still get to bring your flair to it, but that it's more common, you know what I mean? Like that you're having these mm -hmm. similar experiences. And I think that's where versus me, going this workshop and doing this and I'm sharing it, but like now we're all doing it together. That makes any more clear. Sure. Um, it definitely makes sense to have a sort of cohesive approach. Um, how will you know if students are benefiting from it? So one of the ways that I'm really excited to <laughs> dig into in the next few weeks is when our, well, I mean, we already saw it. We're already seeing shifts in the data that's coming forward, but I think um, we'll use our data, we'll use our teacher eye and um, observation. Um, I think also one of the ways that we know it's working is just in the way that teachers are talking about reading has changed. And so before, you know, teachers might have, including myself, would maybe get focused on like a grade level text or a certain text level, but not really being able to talk up at depth about what what does it mean to be that kind of reader? And so now it's like, okay, I'm I'm not we're not talking about text levels, we're talking about skills. We're talking about the skills you need to be a reader. And so I feel like those conversations are evidence that it's having an impact. And then I know that that impact will continue to see in our student um, student data. Yeah. Scott. Yeah, uh, MC and Franco, this is awesome. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen anyone so excited about literacy. Uh, <laughs> And it's just great. It makes me want to go home and read a book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, no more audiobooks. Um, so I, those of us who are educators know how important, uh, like, um, learning by doing is. And so you mentioned this. I think you called it bridge to practice. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And so can you just you taught you mentioned it and then yeah. and then kind of went. I thought you were coming back. And so yeah, I'd love to hear more about what what that looks like. Yep. Um, for for educators in in our school, and then a really quick question. Um, I, I don't remember if you mentioned this. Is it just K through two? Is it no, everyone in K, the? It's K through four. K through four. Okay. It's all of our multilingual yeah. educators. It's special ed yeah. and and our SLPs are doing it as well. One one little tidbit to that. It's like you know how there's this the Google Chat, and I don't know. If, remember one day, like all fired up on Google Chat, third grade teachers like, hey. What's going on this year? We were all doing the assessment. Like, what are you? Are, we're having a debate about, you know, the question four, question whatever, four yeah. on the, you know, the quiz. And what are you guys thinking? And you know, and it was just neat. And then like Google Chat just lit up with everyone being like, I thought this, this, this. Yeah. you know. And so, it, you know, so that was really, and that's that's yeah. kind of funny. You know, like where think about that. The whole building literally is, you know, is working on this. Yeah. Um. So that was really neat. Went back to the bridge to practice. Um, so what it is, we have like, I just kind of picked like three kids and uh -huh. was like, okay, I'm going to like try this and kind of like was practicing a few things that I'd learned that week. And then they give you, cause at the end of the session, mm -hmm. you print off your like bridge to practice things and you have to journal nice. and all this stuff. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and I just thought, you know, it wasn't like required, but I'm like, I'm going to try this and see how this feels is mm -hmm. added 
you know, thing. And so I was like, oh, I really like this. And so I was actually trying it out and I'm like, oh, I want to do this further. Like, and just kind of makes me, and I didn't just choose, like, I kind of was like random, like, okay, you're up here, you're here, you're here. Let's see how this plays out. And so that's been really neat for my own practice to just kind of play with that and like, you know, journal and write and be like, oh, this did work. Oh, I need to find, you know, what, what's, what's not working. Maybe it's me, that kind of thing. But every week it, you just kind of go and you sample something and then you, and sometimes it's not just every week. Sometimes it will be something you try over a couple and then you, um, and you have the, your, they call ABC, your folders and the, these kids and you gather the materials about what you've been doing with them. And then you um, look back and look at the data and then see how it's changed. And uh-huh. that was really, it's been really interesting to see. Yeah. So, and I've saw some, you know, I had one student, you know, who as like the whole class learning, we're learning like um, vowel teams, you know, EE and EA and OI and OY. And we had done this way back when this funny little thing about OI is in the middle, OY, it's just like this little rap thing. And it was so funny. I was giving this um, the thing in January or mid- December, the spelling um, inventory. And I heard this kid go, oh, I is in the middle. <laughs> and he's writing the word spoil. And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> anybody else hear that? <laughs> and it was just kind of funny that I thought, oh, this all that kind of sit, he's repeating those sounds over and over, even though someone wasn't necessarily ready for that kind of spelling thing, they remember that, like, that sound. And I was like, oh, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Yeah. even though we're doing now in the unit for spelling, it's, this week lesson, you know, unit 12 and foundations is the OI, OI, but they had it back in January, which is really yeah. kind of fun. That's cute. A little, little bit. Yeah. Uh, Kristen. Oh. Hi, can Hi. you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, I just want to appreciate that hearing you both talk reminds me like what technicians teachers are and the challenge of taking this like really kind of technical and complex uh, sort of, you know, heady and nuanced information and then having to like translate it at the classroom level for really, really young kids um, is just uh, such a challenge. And it's great to hear that you all are having just feeling really inspired and really enthusiastic about it. And um, Mary Kat, I love hearing that you feel that you can still bring your own flair to it. It's one of my favorite words. Um, and it just sounds like it is, um, there's like some fun, like, it, you know, kids are having fun hearing that this kid is like, you know, doing his rap while, you know, and maybe doing an assessment is just really great to hear. Um, so thank you for all the work that you're doing and applying all this new knowledge. Um, and I think I'm a little bit piggybacking on Scott's question and maybe it's a a mic question but i'm curious how right you all are like going through these modules and you're getting these new skills and i'm hearing about the bridge to practice and i'm also kind of curious at like a at a district level you know how you kind of take what you're learning here and maybe apply it to areas where we're seeing like a general need for improvement across the district and how you kind of you know again, like making sure that it's not like happening in a vacuum, but it's really being then used to address actual areas, uh, you know, identified areas, you know, for improvement. Um, I'm just, I'm curious how that's happening. And I also maybe have a request for Mike. I think at the next meeting, we're going to see spring data. And maybe if you could help us to see like a through line between this new approach to um, training for our teachers and then where that's showing up in the data that we'll see at our next meeting. I'll take both of them. So, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So I would say there's a lot that we've learned um, from this model that's extending beyond the elementary schools, uh, in particular, the rigor and the relevance of it. But um, the middle school has also been doing a cohort around adolescent literacy instruction with Dr. Sarah Lupo, who the elementary folks will connect with next year. So we'll have that continuance of those two things connecting, and that's been really amazing. And our high school literacy interventionist has also been involved in that Dr. Sarah Lupo work and has been focusing in on uh, vocabulary and comprehension concepts aligned with adolescent literacy. So we've had this whole kind of K through 12 literacy discussion um, that's been really great. And the other thing that we we do quite naturally is the intervention teams at all of the schools communicate really well. 
and so we're we're bridging those conversations, the things that we're learning at the elementary school and the middle school, bridging them into our diagnostic conversations, looking at our data, getting more consistent with our data, our local assessment plan. All of that is really melding together really nicely um, through this. So I, I think we're getting a lot from it that's impacting district work and district conversation. I think like Rachel Amsey said, like one of the big things is that the level of our conversations about literacy have changed and that's shifted across K through 12. That's not just at the elementary school. Great, thank you. It's helpful to hear just about like the integration piece. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Yep. 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 Yeah. And we've covered three units this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been I, every Monday. Every Monday is our staff meeting is dedicated to this. Sorry, yeah. Oh, go ahead. That was that's a good segue because I first wanted to just say thank you because this is been a ton of work. I can tell. I like a real investment yeah. on the part of the teachers and the the you know, I'm sure you could have filled your Monday staff meetings with many, many things. Mm -hmm. And to hear that not only are you filling the time with this, like really devoting yourself to, to learning this, but also like staying late basically <laughs> on a regular basis because you're getting so into it. It's just really inspiring. And so I first wanted to say thank you for that. I mean, my team on Monday, as I was leaving and we were talking and I, I think I said this already that I was coming up, they're like, Tell them this has been really a an amazing experience throughout the year, awesome. and they're like, this has been one of the best professional ones. That, it's been one of the best professional developments I've had. That you know, I look forward to the Mondays. It's, I'm bringing it right back to my teaching, and you know, so my whole team was just like, I, I should have just started jotting <laughs> notes down because I'm like, oh yeah. yeah, but it was like it was neat as I was going out the door, like like make sure you tell them I said that. So. It really, people have really enjoyed it. And, That's awesome. And like, like I said, here it's June and we're not tired of it. Like that is really, and I mean that, like it's because every week's new, it's information. It's really great stuff. Yeah. I I don't know what you mean when you say program agnostic. Can you give us a yeah, little clarification on that? So <laughs> they say it a lot. They say it a lot. <laughs> And I think it's really important, and I'm glad you asked that question. So, for example, if you were to get, so one of the programs we use at UES and RVS is Foundations, and that's a phonics and spelling program. It also has a handwriting component in. If we were to pull in a trainer from Foundations, their training would be heavily driven by their program, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but what happens is it really gets you hyper-focused on the program in front of you and doesn't always allow you to think about how to apply it outside of that program. So mm -hmm. if I'm not using that program and I don't have that manual in front of me, how do I then still do all this great teaching? And, and obviously teachers can figure that out, but that's where letters, when they kind of brag about being program agnostic, they're basically saying, we're giving you tools that regardless of the resources you um, in your district and yeah. your schools are using, you're going to have the right tools. And so they're not there to, you know, vouch for one program over another. They're there to just say, this is just good literacy instruction. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I got it. I'm definitely a novice when it comes to these things, other than reading to my kids at night, which I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Um, I'm also curious to know if there's things that teachers have had to unlearn during this practice. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's so, I mean, maybe it's unlearning, but I don't really like to use that term because I think it's more of just building upon what we've known before. I see. Um, like, or building or just, I don't know. It's just shifting your thinking too. Yeah. You're know, like, maybe you were like, I thought this was the way. And then you're like, oh, I've learned this. And it's like, rather than that, it's made you think of it differently and maybe go a different way. Yeah. You know, I feel it's more like a shift than just being like undo. Uh -huh. Or it's that critical eye piece that I was yeah. talking about before. It's like, it's not that everything that I've, I mean, I've been a teacher for, you know, 15, 17 years now and teaching literacy for many of them. 
it's not that what I was doing before was bad. It's just that I have the opportunity now to learn new things and add to my practice, which is mm -hmm. what teaching is about. Mm -hmm. Teaching is always about adding more tools to the toolkit and strengthening the tools you have. And that's what I feel like we're doing here. And so I think what it's allowed us to do is as opposed to unlearning, it's allowed us to look at our past practice and reflect on what parts of that were beneficial for students and what parts of that is it time to replace with a new uh -huh. technique or tool. Got and it. so I feel like it's more, like I said before, like that critical eye piece, just mm -hmm. like that's feeling very sharpened. Yeah. And kind of like the best practice. Like yeah. That, you hear that term, but like, you know, where you're taking all like these things and be like putting it together to be the best practice. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's just added more to our toolbox and made us think about the tools more critically. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what is the better avenue? Oh, we're assessing, we have this one. Oh, this one goes deeper. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, the word, you know, yeah. things like that. We just, I feel like I have just more, um, you know, you think about this, some of the images of the teacher with all the toolboxes and all the things we're carrying. I got math, I got this, I got that. And I just think like, I've just, you know, collected more in that toolbox, which is anytime you have more because every child is different and yeah. their brains are all different. So you, you know, to stand in this, I, you know, that's why I like gathering them in a small group and reading and then shifting those things and working with them because everybody approaches it differently. And so the more tools I have for every kid and figuring that out is better. And it's. And what I hear, particularly MC say a lot in a, in a roundabout way is that she feels the psychological safety to try new things out yeah. Yeah. and that the, our teachers need the time to learn and to think and to collaborate and to do that in a very safe environment without getting blasted. And so I hear, I hear a lot of that right now. And I, and that needs to continue to, you know, I was, I went into Dina Cody's room in the beginning of the year and it was like one of the first days she was doing a Hagerty lesson. And she's like, I'm messing this up all over the place. And my superintendent's sitting here watching me and that's okay, kids. Cause I'm learning, you know, like I'm trying something new. I would love to go in her classroom now to see yeah. what she's like. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That that would like, be, I think you would just be blown away. Like yeah. the kids would practically be leading the lesson. But Dina felt safe enough to continue on even though I'm sitting right there yeah. Katie's right next to me you know yeah. so it was it, yeah. that was pretty cool that they're trying new things and feel yeah. safe enough to take that risk and I think with that vulnerability comes that curiosity rather than judgment or defensiveness mm -hmm. and so that vulnerability allows you to be curious and to dig deeper and I think I know that's something that is shifting yes. in a big way in our conversations and I really appreciate the opportunity for us to do this training in our collaborative teams um, and because we very well could just be in our own classrooms in front of our screens doing this and in, in kind of a vacuum. Yeah. But by doing it together, you know, like Mary Kat said, we, we pause and we turn to each other and we're like pointing across the room because we're thinking of the same kid or the same group of kiddos and we're going to do it tomorrow. Well, and even remember the evening class we had a, for one of the units, we had to do this evening um, virtual live virtual thing and someone hosted at a house so that we could all still yeah. like, you know, be part of it together. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember because I was on Roxbury, I was like, I can't. So they Googled me in. So I was yeah. like, I'm still like, you know what I mean? Because I was like, I still want to be like, because that's, that's one of the really enriching thing I want to make sure I also say it's, we've been working on it together as a team. And look at that as a whole team, like I said about our chats up to fourth grade, when they're asking about a question, what did you put for this one? Or, and that's been really neat. And uh, and powerful. Yeah. Really quickly, I'm curious. So let me mention the sort of vulnerability um, that, that, that the teachers are are allowing for and then the excitement clearly. And so Rachel, you said that that next year or you're being trained to be a team lead. I can't remember what the words. Yeah, mean. lead Lexia lead teacher, I think that's what they call it. And yeah. so there's there's clearly a plan for like moving this forward beyond just the, the two year um program um and that's yeah that's awesome i'm wondering what are the what other things um could we be doing as a board to support um that that continual learning beyond just the the two years of the program yeah. and it, this is sort of open to mike and libby as well not just you two I mean, one thing I'll just say is like, join us in our curiosity and join us in our ability to be vulnerable. And I think that goes a long way. Um, and, and, and that with that curiosity, I think comes that excitement and that passion to ask questions about what else could we be doing? 
uh, versus what are we not doing? Like, I think those are the kinds of ways that I'm, that I feel like my, I'm trying to shift questions as they're coming at me. It's not necessarily about what I'm not doing. It's about what more could I be doing or how could I do it a different way? So when the community and when our colleagues and our leadership join us in that curiosity, it just, it, I think it will just yeah. continue to increase the, all the results right. we're seeing from this. I think about like um, you spoke to the math work we did for mm -hmm. quite a few years with Christian Quartermunch and how like once again, we were all thrilled about that work, right? Because we were going, trying something with kids, coming back. We were looking at math assessments, very exciting work, right? That's gone away. We are still doing yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I mean that we are like, oh, and we're all saying, you know what Christian would say. <laughs> and we have like, or we get our work together and we're like, we even have like slideshows of kids working. We're like, oh, remember that? Let's put up kids what do you see different work I mean and so that's like so even though that's gone we're still continuing yeah. that really good work that we did with him and growing with it and so because we when you see something like the work with Christian and now like this when you see its impact in your classroom and on your students yeah. and in your teaching it just fuels your fire mm -hmm. and it like it's like oh this works this is it, it is, uh, you see the improvement. So it kind of gets you more pumped. The same feel, I feel like we have not lost our Christian quarter munch, like we're going, you know? I mean, we kind of, mm -hmm. remember this year, we were kind of like between the, um, we were taking breaks between the math and we were doing our cycles. Yeah. And cause we equally want to do math too. And I'm like, okay, I, I say we do a math one, a literacy one, math, you know? And then, yeah. and then I'm like, I'm not ready for us to do math and literacy yeah. yeah, because we were just so excited to, uh, and what I mean by that is that we would have our work where we do an assessment on a particular thing. And then we look at the data, then we go out and do a specific teaching cycle. And then we come back and reassess and look at that data. How did it change? We're like, okay, or, you know, that was so we did these little cycles all throughout the year mm -hmm. um and that was great and we yeah. were alternating literacy and math and then i kept being like i think we could do both <laughs> and i was like nope <laughs> <laughs> slow it down <laughs> in that same vein i think something that the school board can do is be mindful that especially for our k through four educators they're generalists so when the next big concern comes up or the next thing comes up, we have to remember that we made a commitment to focus on literacy and and allow that time. You know, this this letter training is a big commitment. Yeah. And we've we've had to prioritize that and we have to stick to that. We have to see that through. Um, and it can be hard because other priorities pop up and yeah. we'll try and figure out ways to do that without yeah. destroying our our teachers who have a, a capacity themselves, you know. Yeah. No, and we can also communicate it out to you and, and let the community know what's going on because, mm -hmm. um, you know, the enthusiasm is very palpable and it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, if it's infectious at all, which I think it is, uh, that paints a really good picture of, I think, what's what's going on at, at the K-4 level. We'll talk about this time. Yeah, really. <laughs> also, and also financial commitment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
like they're delivering on the goods. Like they, every person we've worked with, I'm like, that was a stellar presenter. That was a great presenter. Like, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. one of my K colleagues was saying yesterday, like you, um, some of our uh, virtual sessions have been on these early release days. And so it's like, as soon as the kids leave, it's three hours on the computer after a day of teaching, you know, mm -hmm. even a shortened day. And she was saying, but it doesn't feel like a drag. Like it doesn't feel like, it, she's like, I'm engaged, I'm excited, I'm into it. And so it's the content, but it's also the the staffing that Letters does is just phenomenal. They've um, been, I've been really impressed. It goes by fast. You know, the time goes by fast because you are engaged, mm -hmm. you know, and like, and, and um, so that was, I thought that was really, yeah, on most days. Absolutely. And we just recently had one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you circle back to, I think, Jill's first question about the path forward, because I think now after hearing this, I just want to make sure I understand. So it's a two-year course, and then you're going to be a trainer in this course, or so after that, do we still engage letters, or do, have we had after the two year point, have we internalized that? Or so so letters has kind of, there's two volumes. There's volume one, which is what we're going through right now. And that's really on foundational literacy skills. And then there is a volume two, which is more, you know, when you're thinking about like Scarborough's reading rope, it's like, it's more of the comprehension language vocabulary piece. And so um, I don't think a decision has been made yet on whether or not we're going to proceed with the volume two piece, but the amount of um, knowledge that we've learned and yes, I do believe have started to internalize from volume one is allowing us the capacity to then um, do our own investigations and conversations on what would be covered in the future um, letters training if we choose not to commit to that. So, because like Libby said, it is a massive time um, commitment on our part. So, you know, for all of our literacy educators, it's been an amazing opportunity and really bringing us together at the cost of we don't have Monday staff meetings. And so we're we're lacking an opportunity to come together as a whole staff. And we found ways to do that, but that's not necessarily sustainable to continue to give every Monday afternoon for the next however many years, uh, because you would see detriments in other areas if we continued on that way. So what? next year would look different, but with the same sort of general. Story. No, next. Uh, oh. Well, I think next year, if we continue on with volume one, um, we have one more unit. And so I, I am. I think that there's some conversations about changing the pacing of it. And so possibly would it be, um, you know, like two staff meetings a month for this and two staff meetings devoted to something else. And so we've put in, we've kind of done a lot of front loading this year. And then that's going to allow us to um, maybe achieve a more like long-term sustainable pace moving forward. Because yeah. Rachel will be certified and we're hoping to get more people certified. We'll have an in-house trainer and she'll have access to the letters resources for any new hires that we have. They would start at the beginning of this process yeah. and be able to have an internal person that we don't have to book out. We don't have to have a virtual component. We have somebody in-house that can do uh -huh. those. And then when we look at volume two, what we're thinking right now is finding a way to make that um, optional and supported. Like one of the things we're doing in our professional learning right now is offering courses posted through Southern New Hampshire on campus right after school once a week for eight weeks. So making it accessible for educators that want to continue that learning, but to be able to have, like what Rachel's saying, to do four straight years of no staff meetings is not reasonable um, and probably not affordable sustainably, but Letters does things where they offer the trainings as courses uh, for credit. And all of our teachers have contractual um, opportunities to take courses. So we have a way that we think we can continue the learning and we're working with Letters to figure out what that could look like. That's helpful. I don't yeah. think I understood that I'm sorry. So it's helpful yeah. to kind of put a, seems like it was a really smart investment. Yeah. It's gonna pay dividends. But something Rachel said too, when it goes back to like, how can the board support like half days? You know, those are a pain for parents. I know they're a pain for parents, <laughs> um, but that's how we're using half day. Like we can't pay our entire elementary school educators to stay after school to do this, you know? So that's why we're putting in half days. We can't get subs for everybody, you know, 
like in the old days where the subs were abundant and you could rotate teachers throughout the day. We can't do that anymore. So half days may be some place that you see more of in school calendars as we go forward because of financial difficulties and lack of substitutes. Uh, but that, this is the type of thing that we're using that time for. Yeah. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Rachel's got birthday cake to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, thank you so much. It's super exciting. It's really great. It really helps us to know what's going on inside the classroom and to see your enthusiasm is wonderful. And I know we're a box of fun, but I'm sure you have better places to be on your birthday, Rachel. So happy birthday and thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you both very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for you. having us. You're awesome. Thank you. thank you for this work. It's really great. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's like what? Um, excellent. So, um, the summer board retreat planning, and um, we have very helpfully outlined in an email to kind of guide the discussion some uh, kind of streams of, of possible subjects we could talk about. I think um, everyone has gotten the various doodle polls. Um, it looks like we're probably aiming towards we're close. August. Uh, we might have to satellite in Mia from from Wisconsin. That is going to have to happen. Yeah. Did you miss last year? Also, I missed something in August last year, but I actually didn't show up this time for the board meeting. It is looking the meeting last year. It is looking like, although um, it's mommy, mommy can't come. Uh, August fifteenth. Uh, from four to eight is the winning date because Mia is the only adult board member who cannot oh, make it. it. Voting board member, thank you, who cannot make it that day, but if she beams herself in. Okay. Oh, and I'm... Oh, <laughs> August. <laughs> All right, then it would be August 15th from four to eight is the winning date. Yeah. Um, but before I start that, I just wanted to, uh, as folks know, there was some few education related issues at state house, uh, this year. Um, and, um, yeah, there was definitely some involvement both by the administration. Actually, uh, I was asked to testify a couple of times as well, um, uh, I don't know if Mia sat in or testified or not, but um, there's a lot of this too. Yeah. Um, so you know, one thing that just has come up in some some kind of internal conversations was you know how do we engage, and this is one of the topics for the retreat, but how do we engage at the legislative level uh, when the administration goes in? Obviously, um, you know these these bills affect us. Uh, we have a an excellent administration with a lot of expertise. Um, we also have a superintendent who is, I think, really kind of established herself as a leader uh, in the state among superintendents. Um, so I think she is uh, often tapped and she has some proximity as well. Um, uh, so there just were some questions about you know, how we engage. We're not going to answer them tonight, um, but it's a possible topic of retreat. But uh, I think as a preview for that discussion, um, there was a request just to get like a quick overview before we start this discussion of kind of what the legislative session looked like and some of the bills that were out there and some of the things we did to engage. I'll just start. I testified a couple times on Act 127, um, basically just detailing the challenges that it uh, posed to the district. Um, you know, the choices we had to make, the fact that we were forced into uh, some difficult decisions uh, without a lot of process, and also the fact that the ground was continually shifting under us was made it also very difficult. Um, you know, and I, I think it, as uh, you know, we're going through right now, it, it's caused um, uh, some extreme, you know, heartache for uh, one of our two communities in particular. Um, so I, I detailed that. Um, 
and then to the extent I pontificated, I, I talked about the need for the legislature to be a little more cautious about how they move forward and, um, you know, make sure that uh, they're kind of making sure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing uh, and, you know, being, being strategic and thoughtful about education and also tying it to a lot of, of other issues around the state. Um, you know, the, the, the challenges that education is having are related to uh, the demographics of the state, uh, the difficulty of, of getting housing, the fact that, that families can't afford to move into towns, um, you know, a lot of other issues and just asking the legislature to, uh, you know, kind of be as, as thoughtful and strategic about how these issues link and um, how uh, conversations around, you know, our mental health services and healthcare and, and housing uh, can trickle down oftentimes to schools. Um, and that was, that was kind of, I think, my my engagement and I was asked both times on pretty short short notice um if anyone else has done anything with the legislature otherwise I can turn it over to to Libby to talk about just a quick overview of what she's done I testified four times this year uh once Jake was there with me the first time in House Ways and Means I don't think you testified that day, though. You're and there. I, just to clarify, I believe Jake was there on his on his professional yeah. capacity. Although I did yeah. embarrass him a little bit as a board member because I think it was like day two as board member for you that day. Um, I testified twice in front of the Senate Finance Committee, once with Jim, one time or two times, just once um, about one twenty seven and the drivers impacting our budget. Central Vermont educators are called to Senate Finance quite a bit because Ann Cummings is the director, the chair of that committee, and she's Central Vermont, obviously. So um, she likes to hear from, so I went in with um, Chris Hennessy, Ryan Herity, the superintendents from around Central Vermont. And then I also testified for a long session with House Education Committee around the same thing, the drivers of education. And I particularly spoke to um, what Jim was just talking about, about the heartbreaking decisions that our board had to make throughout this budget cycle with house education. So those are the things I testified on this year. In the past, I've testified on condoms in schools. I've testified on literacy. I have testified on PCBs. I'm called regularly by senators and, and representatives or emailed regularly about my opinion on such bills. Um, I think those are the main topics that I have. There was one on social media. I did not testify on that. It was, no, it did not pass. It did not, it changed considerably. It's on VPR now around the governor about whether he's gonna veto it or not, but it, it changed considerably and it moved out of schools and more to internet companies or I think social media companies. Once it went out of schools, I stopped kind of paying attention to it. But I didn't testify on that. The literacy bill, how much of that changed? There was a literacy bill and there was a concern about a com demand for some inordinate amount of- 40 hours, yeah. Developed. 40 hours came out of it. Um, 40 hours came out of it. I did write a letter to the legislatures asking them not to ban certain literacy practices. Um, and, but I didn't testify on that. I haven't testified on that in several years. Um, so there is a literacy bill in that it talks about screeners, um, which we already do. And it talks about, um, trying to think, it talks about other types of professional learning that's around, more about data literacy, about how to use data to inform our instruction, which is professional learning that all of us can get behind and, and is needed for all of us. We're just having a conversation about that in our leadership team today. Um, those were the main components that stayed in that bill. Um, and, and exactly what you heard tonight from Rachel and MC, is a lot of the intention behind that bill that is there now that I don't know if he signed yet or not. I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything about it. 
Yep. Yep. It just sounded like a weird sound. Yeah. Any questions on that? Again, we don't want to have the discussion, but I just wanted to give some chance to. Um, yeah. Just if it can, like, um, maybe, and maybe you, neither of you can answer this, but um, how does your activity or our district's activity compare to other districts in the legislature? There are definitely certain superintendents that are tapped to um, testify more often than others mm -hmm. based on the topic. Got it. So, for instance, Mark Tucker, who has been, who's retiring in a week and a half, but um, he his schools were hit particularly hard with PCBs and that whole process in early. And Mark has become an expert in PCBs and that whole law. He testifies weekly on PCBs. You know, like he's our guy yeah. to go testify on that. Um, Lynn Coda, I testify with Lynn Coda quite a bit. Lynn Coda is an, just is amazing at testifying around mental health needs in schools and how schools have become the social net and how we're almost robbing our mental health agencies because we have to, because our mental health agencies are struggling. And so we have to pick up, pick up the slack and we're actually stealing people from mental health, you know, like she's excellent at that. And so Lynn Coda testifies quite a bit and testifies around um, mental health, special education pieces. I was asked to testify quite a bit about financial matters this year um, because I, because we were in a challenge and, yeah. and uh, we worked really hard to figure it all out. And um, I was pretty vocal at the trustee level because I'm a Vermont superintendent trustee, which is kind of like the board of directors for the trustees. I'm on that. And I was pretty vocal before emergency red lights started flashing, I was pretty vocal about some aspects that I was seeing as problems right away. Are you still talking about 127? 127, yeah. And and in that group, um, and determined to learn the impacts. You know, you know, I asked Jake and Jill and Morgan Daybell, Daybell who's the head of ASBO. Um, they got, Morgan got to be one of my best friends during that because I was asking a lot of questions and so trying to figure it out. And they wanted superintendents from districts who were having to gain tax capacity and lose tax capacity. They wanted a mixture of people who could talk broadly about it, not singularly about their district. Um, and having that had experience in Franklin Northwest, which is a very different district than Montpelier Roxbury, I could speak on multiple levels of how I could see this law impacting us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why I was tagged early and often mm -hmm. for that particular law. And it was this year pretty comparable to other years uh, uh, in the legislature for you as far as like frequency? I'm just thinking. Yeah, I think I, it depends on the year. No, I think it depends on the year. I probably was there a little bit more than I usually am. Mm -hmm. I certainly watched more than I usually yeah. do this year because of all the conversations and ways and means and um, when I, yeah, I, yeah, but that's not testifying. Just That's just paying attention to it, having it on in the background. Yeah. Um, I'd say it was a pro I I do testify every year on something. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting that probably the watching was because you were making a budget and wondering if you were gonna have to have <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, throw oh, the yeah. spreadsheet yeah. you had out and yeah. start with a new one. That's why I was yeah. watching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we all were watching a little bit more than we usually do. Okay. Jeff, Jeff Francis, it may change because Jeff is retiring. Mm -hmm. Um, but Jeff Francis definitely um picks people to mentor to how to testify and and i was definitely one of the superintendents he chose a few years back to teach how to testify mm -hmm. so all of my testimony goes through bsa it's not just me writing it off it goes through the vermont superintendents association got it chelsea may do it differently with chelsea myers taking over the bsa Other questions, and again, we will likely have a deeper dive on this or potentially the retreat, so we can. Is there a problem we're trying to solve? Or I think, I think what we're trying to do is just some questions were raised about, um, the people on the board just wanting to have 
I think a few few things. One, making sure that what we were what our administrators were saying, we, we knew that we knew and were in the loop. Um, so we weren't hit by a you know, hey, your your superintendent said X at the legislature and be like, we, we didn't even know we were talking about that. Mm -hmm. So just so we're kept in the loop. Um, and then also the ability, you know, some issues, some issues have political and, and community reverberations that we may want to weigh in, um, you know, that kind of go beyond just the expertise of, of our staff. Um, and then uh, someone else in the discussion raised just kind of knowing how, and I think Mia just alluded to this, knowing how our superintendent is using her time. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, the legislature can be a sticky place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just kind of that balance between weighing in strategically and um, maybe not getting over relied on by the DSA or having it become, you know, too heavy a distraction. So I think just those type of considerations. And I, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that, you know, if, if Libby is testifying or someone else is testifying, the board knows and, and maybe with the realization that that doesn't isn't always going to be in real time because sometimes it's you know 10 a.m you get a call and you're like we have a hearing at noon and can come in um but you know so it's it's not happening here and then, and then we we don't have a clue or or find out um you know, other challenges there's also i also this year was different in that i didn't do a lot of prepared testimony I was asked to come in to answer questions and I didn't know what those questions were gonna be except for the broad understanding of 127 and our budget. Um, and there was a point in time where I was eating, sleeping and dreaming our budget. So like, I didn't have much, there was like, I didn't prepare something to hand in, right? That would go on a public record often this year. So that's another thing to consider. And then the, the other thing I'd like to say too, is that um, our principals rarely testify I think Jason's done it once and uh, our teachers do testify and I don't know when they do that. They do not ask me. They don't talk to me about that. And that's a line that's not drawn. That's a line that's drawn because they need the freedom to be able to it goes back to psychological safety. Our teachers need to need to feel safe to be able to talk to our state representatives about their opinions and their perspectives. And I trust them to do so. So I do not. I know that several of our teachers testified this year but I didn't know before they went. <laughs> well, for what it's worth, I, I, I appreciate that. And I've, I've always been really impressed with your testimony and having been someone who has listened to superintendents testify my entire 20 year career with the state of Vermont now, I can't believe Jeff is not gonna be there. I know. <laughs> um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I also think they needed to hear from superintendents in real time. I'm thinking of like, there was the hearing about the school budgets getting defeated. It's not just our school budget. There are districts that were very low spending districts who were getting yes. hammered. And yeah. they needed to hear from those folks who maybe the outcome of a budget being voted down was the same, but the, the reason or the impact can be very different. Yes. But I definitely want to balance that with like a respect for your time. Cause it's true. The more that, that they can, they'll take all the time. And I literally, I had three days this summer where I went in and said the same thing. Three different, <laughs> three different committees. Same, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I definitely want to support protecting and balancing your time and making sure that there is a superintendent who can yeah. be heard there. Yeah. No, I, I think we... And you too, Jim. I thought you did a fantastic job. I really appreciate oh, thank you. your comments. Um, yeah, no, and I think with... Yeah, I, I think we do want to have... I mean, my feeling, and, and I know we need a discussion, is we do want to have that balance, especially with, I think, a year or two when there's going to be a lot of important bills and we have a citizen legislature that you know as you said not not at the table and not at the menu but not everyone in the legislature is an educational expert and we know that they're very weakly staffed so there's a lot of good intentions but um you know they Meaning they don't really have staff not that they're staff <laughs> they've, they've got a couple like legislative council right they don't really have right, but they, they don't, don't have really staff. have staff they don't yeah they don't individually have staff people yeah they don't have offices of people um yeah no they don't they don't have like it's not like congress where they've got 18 22 year olds working for them um no they have middle school pages <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh 
yeah, so that expertise and perspective is is important for them, and it's important uh, the the policies that impact our district. Um, so we, um, me and I kind of sat down and bucketed uh, five areas where we thought. Oh, good. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but um, the, I, I have very basic questions about the board retreat. Yes. Um, like first question, and there's they're very basic. First question is why is it called a retreat? And second of all, is, is it, it a public is it a public meeting? Like great question. Yeah. Um so call the retreat because it's always been called a retreat. Yeah, first first question is is force of habit. Long meeting. Sec, second habit is, second question is yes. I, I think there was a time when we would like walk over to the Vermont Historical Society and use a room over there yeah. just for a change of, of view. Um yeah. and then sometimes we a couple of times we've done, it hasn't been in a while. We either had a facilitator or we've like talked about what we'd be if we were a tree. Um, you know, to to, to kind of you know help mix it up a little. Um, I don't think we've done that the last couple of times. If it's a board training, yes, it, then that can be done in an executive session, like a an actual training. Pietro's here to talk about yeah. employment law or something like that. That can be done in executive training. But if it's the board's business. Um, there is no reason that it's not a public meeting. It's a public meeting. Is it held here? Yeah, I think it be, probably yeah. will be. I mean, we we could. If, it would be nice if we could retreat. I, mean, yeah. I was thinking the whole time, like, we were going to go somewhere and do more fun. Or Buy something. some water. Yeah. <laughs> no. Maybe, maybe, we'll get... maybe we'll bring some chocolate chip yeah, cookies. Sure. Well, we, we, have have we will yeah. have food because it's four hours. It's going to be four hours long. Yeah. So we yeah. will have food. Yeah, we'll, we'll have, like, a lunch. And, and then we can consider a, a space. I mean. Um... Well, there's a new law that says you have to record every every meeting now. So we'll be here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be just For our friends from Orca. Maybe we can, yeah. Bring fun drinks or something. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good question. Uh, any other just kind of basic questions about the the retreat before? I was just going to say I just put the stuff that I put in an email into a blank document so Libby could share put it at least up on the screen so yeah. we all have the yeah. same we're all looking at the same thing and everybody who's watching online or watching afterward. I was going to ask him. After Jim does our does our little preamble here, I was going to ask Tim what he would how he would bucket it. Yeah. yeah. yeah so the ones we came up with, and I'll let me and Libby we know how I got this wrong. Um, kind of continue work on district priorities. Uh, you know, I think the of our three um, kind of goals or. Outlooks or the exact word we landed on is escaping me, but kind of the solidifying communications and community engagement see the, seems to be the one that that we've given the least form to. Um, and so one thought was spending, and, and we can do multiple of these, but we also want to be cognizant that we, even though four hours is a long time, we can go back quickly. Um, so particularly the communications and community engagement piece is one where we, I think, at some point need to do more work to give that a little more uh, form and and a little more substance about how we we really want to want to get there. And I know some ideas have floated. So so that was one is to use some some time for that. Um, the other was to you know because you know hopefully we will not have nearly as difficult a budget year as we did this year. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't think that the money tree is going to drop a lot of money uh, either. So um, one might be to realize that we may have some hard decisions to make, hopefully not nearly as, as hard as we did this year, uh, but to kind of outline uh, how we would, how we would kind of apply values and um, you know, priorities in terms of making those decisions. So that way we kind of have some agreed upon parameters for making tough decisions before the actual substance of the decisions are before us. Because because once once it becomes a thing and, and someone's thing and, you know, emotions get high, it can be a lot harder to uh, kind of stake out why why 
you may want to invest in A but not B. So if we maybe spend some time deciding what what parameters and values we want to bring to that decision, um, we can at least have more guidance when it's there and not not quite be so swept up in in uh, the the moment. Um, uh, Part of that, well, this might be a whole bucket in and of itself, um, depending on where we are. Um, I do want to give an update that, uh, as as promised, uh, I have been reaching out to Floor. Floor and I have been going back and forth, and we are pretty close to getting a date for uh, me, Olivia, and I to meet with uh, her and um, I think I think her vice chair and also. Uh, they are having a superintendent transition, so uh, probably both the outgoing and incoming superintendent to continue our discussion about uh, possible merger or uh, you know other collaboration with Wash Central. As you may know, uh, they did not have a fun time either. They did pass their second budget, uh, actually quite a bit more narrowly than we do, um, with a lot of tough cuts. Uh, and they are going through uh, a process of consolidation where they are um, considering the closure of, I believe, two to three of their elementary schools. Um, and, and I think there's uh, definitely some, you know, I think a lot of questions being raised during that. I think part of it is is why why aren't we talking uh, as, as interdistricts? Um, so that, depending on how that conversation goes and, and what happens over the summer, we may have a lot to talk about. Just a really um, quick question, Jim. At some point, I remember there was a reason why they wanted to wait. They were going through some, I can't remember what process. They were going through a building evaluation process. Okay. Uh, and, and when we talked, it was also before we all knew about Act 127 and uh, you know, what, uh, what that, that meant. Um, that was that was their primary reason. I think I think the the consolidation process that they're starting a conversation on now has been informed both by their facilities overview and I think where they are with Act 127. Um, they're also experiencing, um, which looks like it's it's not a trend that's reversing, a a major decline in student enrollment. Um, you know, right now the I think in like the next year or two, the, the combined number of students in Doty and Rumney is going to be less than what Rumney was about five or six years ago. Um, and that's kind of kind of across the board for them. So um, you know, that's that's adding to their financial pressures as well. Um, uh, parameters for superintendent and board legislative advocacy, which we just kind of touched on. Um, that may not be a super huge conversation, and that may be one we could do in a meeting, but I think it's it's definitely one, uh, just given some things that have, have been raised both tonight and elsewhere that we should should have. Um, uh, board and superintendent um, communication, uh, and I think just kind of communication in general. Um, and then uh, board equity training, we're thinking, remind me, we're thinking of that as a training as part of the retreat or just talking about trainings we wanted? Doing the training at the retreat, okay. the idea, if okay. we chose this one. Yeah. And I think something we might want to talk about regardless is, is what trainings the board would want. I know we've got some new members. Um, you know, we definitely, I think, want to do at least an equity training once a year, but, uh, you know, we've we had- have to by policy. We have to by policy. And, um, but there's some other trainings that have been beneficial, and I think with some some new members who haven't had them, there's, um, you know, like the VSBA gives some just kind of trainings on communication, both inner board communication and also communication with the community. Um, uh, Pietro and Heather Lynn's firm have some excellent trainings on the law around harassment, um, you know, employment law, some other things that that's good it's good for the board to know we haven't had one of those in a while um you know and as as libby just mentioned a training is not does not have to be a public meeting so we can um go into to private space and, and talk about you know difficult issues uh without being on camera so um 
And then Tim, you had another that you wanted to potentially put up there? Yeah, something um, in focusing on sort of academics and how um, how we facilitate parental engagement and support of their learners, sort of whether it be on the enrichment side, remedial side, and making sure that it's something that can be done. Something that you know allows sort of parents to really kind of engage or facilitates the engagement, I guess, in parents' ways. Treat parents and educators or yeah. and their kids the, the so that when if parents say want, you know, we've been having this had an email discussion about algebra, and that's one that it's very yeah. being the parent where my kids are, it's very live in my circles. And so yeah. um there's a lot of discussion about okay, so how do we if there's if there's certain things that we want to make sure it's have like where to go, how do we do it? All that kind of stuff, and and do it in a way that's complementary to what's happening for the school. And so I think that kind of it's a topic that I hear a lot about, um, and I thought kind of wrestling with that as a board and kind of saying how do we try to set the sort of parent school child triangle up for the best success. Um, do you think that would go within communications and community engagement, or do you feel like it's a separate thing? Yeah, that's my question, too. Is it part of the communications and community engagement? No, I, I think it's, uh, at least in my mind, it's much more an academics focused conversation. But I mean, obviously, if someone wants to put it somewhere, I'm well, the, the reason I was asking is because you're, when you talk about facilitating parental engagement, it sounds to me to support the kids' academics, our, all kids' academics. It sounds like it is a... I, I think he's saying like parent advocacy for academic programming. Is that um, about the... Academic? Well, there's some of that, but then there's some if you say if something's not... Whether a parent wants something to be provided doesn't mean it's going to be provided. Um, uh -huh. And so um, then the question would be how a parent can can best provide that on their own without uh -huh. that, the okay, I see. Buddy different. Heads okay. Yeah, that is different. Really, like cooperative kind of relationship. Uh -huh. And and because there are times that I've, you know, frankly have heard feedback that it can get to a bit of a head budding. And I, you know, I think that doesn't behoove anyone, frankly. Uh -huh. Um so you know I've had the ideas like just, you know, syllabus and sort of stuff that I, I know teachers have already if provided you know in a, in a way um that parents might be able to sort of oh i noticed my kids having a tough time in this area so i want to look back and, mm -hmm. and focus there or i think my kid can do a little bit of that so i want to well then the resources are there and it's not putting parents who are busy anyway to go search online for, you know, this, that, or the other thing that they believe is worth. So I guess I just wanted to, it's one of the things that, you know, I guess when I was running for the board, I was really interested in, and then we got into some budget discussions. <laughs> and sure did. So I thought when I saw this retreat and it being an opportunity for a little bit of a step back in for thinking that this might be a, a time to, to raise this point that I, has been really important to me. Um, if it's if shared, you know. Yeah. I'd be interested in, like, because I don't know what it's like now. You know, like what is the situation where Harry, like you say, is looking for help in some subject or looking for supplemental to elevate, you know, their student in, in, the, in some subject? I don't know what the lay of the land is. So, like, I feel weird about talking about it when I don't even know what is the, the situation now? So maybe like we've had a lot of presentations, maybe uh, somebody could tell us like, you know, what it what, what goes on in those situations. I don't know who that would be though. Looks like Lynn, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I was wondering about uh, under the equity piece, um, we had a whole equity study done, and I think there should be something in there about implementing some of the recommendations or deciding 
what mm -hmm. parts we're going to try to implement the next, the next year. So then I think if I remember correctly, like one of the one of the recommendations that came out of that was specifically around the board um, and our training. And so I, I do think it's carrying forward some of that for the audit. And I agree that that a revisit um, would be helpful. I and mean, you know, because you're in the equity committee with, with Mia, like we've been doing some of that work already. And, and I think more of that would be um, useful. Yeah, I think it needs to get spread out. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking for the equity training, Mia, uh, if we are going to present data using disproportionality in the future, that the board needs training of how to read those, dis like how to understand disproportionality and how to, without looking at our data yet, but how, how do we look at it? What questions are we asking? Like, what is disproportionality? What is it not? I would love that training. We've been doing that as administrative team right now, so... Um, I was thinking about it today in our meeting that this would be a good board training as well. We are not experts in it, but uh -huh. we could certainly lead through, so, like that could be an internal training using Mike and Jess and myself around what is disproportionality mm -hmm. and how do we look at data in this way? Yeah, I totally agree. I kind of sort of similar to um, Kristen's comment about um, next Kristen. board meeting. And, and when we're receiving data, I think it's really helpful for us to understand the context and then also um, like how to interpret those data right. that we are receiving. Yeah, something like that would would be a good integration of a lot of what our role is, which is one of the reasons I think we get those data presentations is because we are the accountability of superintendent and the administration. And then we also have um, many, we have uh, that woven into our priorities is to ensure that we are serving all kids where they're at and regardless of what their identities are. So I can see how that would cover a lot of what we're trying to do as a board, that particular I training. think Kristen is trying to give it to you. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I would also appreciate, um, and I think we've talked about it as a board before, just the need to better understand how to interpret, understand, and apply data as it's become a bigger part of our presentations in the last year or so. And as the district has um, invested in an incredible amount of time and energy into really like actually just creating a data system that didn't exist before. Um, and as follow up to what Lynn was saying, just sort of, you know, we've had some really, really significant audits of the district over the last year, year and a half, including special ed equity. And while maybe not an audit, um, you know, we've just had this very significant um, strategic planning uh, process for our facilities, and they've all been quite voluminous. <laughs> um, and um, it feels like it feels really important to like, not just, oh, check that box. You know, we did the audit and, but really to kind of understand the life beyond the audit and kind of our responsibilities in terms of um, implementation, decision-making um, and, and kind of future of the district. And then maybe even how those things kind of tie back into our priority areas. Um, and I think for me, I think, it, you know, the bullet I'm not looking at, I'm not double screening. So, um, but kind of, you know, it sounds like there's impetus to sort of create like a framework for when hard decisions come up. Um, and there's sort of a forecasting of some of the things that we anticipate seeing. Um, and I would add to that list and also within the facilities, um, topic area, you know, there's something really significant hanging out in the breeze for the community of Roxbury, which is the fate of the Roxbury Village School. Um, you know, the board has made the decision around um, moving Roxbury students to UES. However, uh, RVS is still kind of within, I think as Libby, we were talking to, like, it's a district asset. It's within our building inventory. And um, our community is very eager to understand what the future intended use of the building is in the district. If the district intends to, you know, look for, seek out, research um, a new use for um, the the building, because there are big, um, you know, and this is going way back to you know our our Act Forty Six um, agreement, but uh, the the town, the community is 
uh, kind of biting their nails on what is to become of the building because it is such a central part of the community. So I just want to add that to that list. And I think just generally speaking, it feels like we have some really big facilities things on the horizon and just follow up to the um, the facility strategic planning process that I, I would like to dig deeper into, like beyond framework, but just like more learning about that. Yeah, that is another excellent bucket as facilities because we had we obviously have the RPS question, um, we have the high school question. I think some of those kind of marry to the Wash Central question. Um, and then I also like the comment about. I think we have to do very intentional work to make sure we had some excellent audits this year and, and over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, part of the retreat might be just making sure that we schedule, we prioritize time during the year to, to have check-ins on, you know, follow-ups on those audits and, you know, what, what we've learned from them and, and uh, make sure they're not just, you know, sitting on shelves. As you're saying that, Jim, I don't remember. I was it was early in my tenure on the board last year in the summer. Did we also plan out the board calendar in the retreat? I don't think we did last year. No. Okay, but that might be a good thing to just, and that kind of goes to maybe just on what trainings are we looking for, but also what data presentations, what updates, um, just so we can get a, a list of of things that we want to make sure we get to uh, as, as the year goes on. We've got an agenda for like a four day retreat. Well, I was going to yeah, say, gonna say that's what we'll end up doing with some of these items because yeah. um, we just have the four hours and um, it will probably be that what we say is we can't get to all of this in one retreat, but that they become meeting topics. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly. I mean, I think I think we will discuss all of those things. Um, I guess the question is, what do we want to prioritize for the board? And I guess uh, if we don't have more items to add, I wonder one thing we maybe could do is people could just sort of labeled one through eight, maybe write down their top four on a sheet of paper, and we could see which top four emerge, and then Mila B and I can try to do an agenda based on that? Does that sound like a good way to go about it? Or? Well, that was the, that would email you. I was just going to say, that's the like analog version of what I was going to suggest, <laughs> which is a mini Google survey, but I, I'm going okay, to piece you're of the paper. Yeah. Um, why, don't, why don't we do a Google survey? And, and that can give people some time to think about it too. Yeah. Um, Bef before we do that, before we close this though, I want to make sure that if anybody has because we'll be asking you to kind of vote and say these to yeah. me feel like they're the most, the ones that will set us best up for success is really the question we're answering. Does anyone have any questions about what's up there before you say, yeah. before we send you the Google? Can we say a little bit more about the number four board and superintendent communication? Because it, it did feel like it's a little bit related to the parental engagement question, but it's also part of our um, priorities um, you know, and separated from the education piece, can we can we talk about fleshing that out a little bit? Yeah. So it's written like I, I first want to thank you for asking because I had wanted to clarify it's board and superintendent communication, but it's not just board to superintendent communication or the other way. It's more like board among the board communication yeah. as well as board and super not with to yeah. the public or from the public. Correct. It's more like us and how we communicate and work together. And um, Rhett, I can't remember if you were on the board at this point, but um, I was still fairly new. We had had one sort of online mini training with, um, I think it was the Montpelier Justice Center on, not, on sort of like, it was sort of conflict resolution, but it was also just like how to communicate and collaborate. But it was really pretty brief. And when that ended, we wanted to continue doing that work together so we could establish some norms for ourselves. I mean, we have a we have policy for how we conduct meetings and how we conduct ourselves as board members, but we don't have anything that goes deeper than that. And so that would be work to help us co-create 
you know, so like values and norms and, and how we communicate and collaborate. And also how, when we, when we do things that say something or do something that kind of is like an ouch moment, how do we, how do we address that together? Um, do, does it have to be like a whole board meeting? Probably not, but like, what are some of the parameters for how to encourage dialogue in those moments so that we can move through them and be able to work together would be a part of that. I guess as you're explaining that, Nina, I'm kind of envisioning that as like a four and five, like they all kind of go to trainings on different, you know, like that seems to be like a communications training, equity training, and I wonder, so as to preserve space for as many topics during the meeting as possible, I mean, like, you think- Oh, you're a combo like, guy. Well, I just wonder <laughs> if we kind of, trainings, unless we're gonna have the training, which I'm, I'm totally game for it too, if we wanna use that time to have a specific training. That, that was the know. idea, was to, yeah. to get in, what either not necessarily a training maybe it would be a training but it would i was envisioning it as more of a conversation among us to set some of our own norms together but it would be how we would use some of the time during the retreat if that's what we chose to do feeling like there's a lot of synergy between four and five so but maybe well, I mean, I think the DE, I mean, the DEI equity training is something we have to do per policy. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's, it's a training. I mean, the board and superintendent communication could just be a, a separate training we did at another time as well. Um, and I think part of that too is just, you know, like, when when the board members you know making sure the board members know that they can go to libya and, and talk things out uh but also knowing that as a board member they should go to libya before they go to a principal um you know those type of those type of things and i'm not sure i'm not sure we've had even some of the basic things for some members i think some members who've been here for a while kind of know those things but and then you know when you're you're you know which hat are you wearing when you're talking, particularly to you know people in the administration, um, or teachers, or teachers? Um, yeah, could you add under two uh, um, um, facilities report? Just specifically how add that to the little list of things there because it also it isn't just deciding what we're going to do about about changing a facility you know it, it's also about like repairs and prioritizing there's a whole bunch of stuff in that report that i think might be part of too i think that that's what i put in front of our eight oh whoops i didn't see I it added as sorry a, as its own thing yeah yeah okay I agreed and take it's it's a it's a big thing i want to add to that bucket of stuff um reconsidering the net zero idea because I think that got left by the wayside when we had our budget. Would you put that under eight or is its own thing? I think that's number eight. Part of eight? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So it does appear though most many of the items in number two are a part of that is better understanding our facilities. Um, I do think that there's a significant overlap between two and eight. I don't totally agree with that. I think number two is more about, it's not about making any decisions on those things. It's more about what are the criteria, what are the criteria we're yeah. going to use when Absolutely. it comes to that. The inspiration for this one is that in the last several years, we've, a couple of years anyway, we found ourselves making big decisions on a very short timeline and would not necessarily with the same kind of process and de de deliberance, deliberation. deliberation that we, that, that right? they, de yeah, um, that they called for. And so it was a little bit more about like, if and when the time comes that we have to make it the decision about this high school, for example, how are we going to do that? So I, I just, that, if what you're trying to do is combine two and eight, I wouldn't combine two and eight. I I think you are, I agree with you that we do need to better understand our facilities as part of being able to make these kinds of decisions, but I wouldn't That's combine right. them as the same yeah. topic for the retreat. I have a question. So 
the word communications is like a very sort of broad, it can mean a lot of different things. And even within this room, it might mean different things. So I would, I would want to talk a little bit more about what we would be looking for on four and one A, because I do think, and again, I'm obviously probably a little more engaged than like your average Montpelier, right? but I get fantastic communication. Like no matter where I look in the morning, I'm seeing that our board meeting is happening, that there's a budget vote. Like I think, I think Anna and I think Mia and Jim and Libby, like you guys do an amazing job of communicating to the community. And I also get really good, really regular updates from the high school from Mr. Kingold. And also when there are things that happen, that has also been really lovely to have. Like, so when my kid shows up, I have some context or I can ask her rather than like, how was your day? Fine. I actually know, oh, you have stars testing next week or whatever, because otherwise I wouldn't know. So I, I, so my statement is I, I think the district communications functioning is really good. Like I think what Anna and Libby do, and I think what you guys do as board chair and vice chair is really good. Um, I don't have complaints about that. So I guess I would wonder, or I'd want us to focus on where do we see that there is a pocket? Because there's been lots of times that you can send surveys, you can host, right? You can host conversations and it might be either that it's a self-selecting group or the people you really need to hear from as we've all tried, like it's very hard to hear from some of the voices that need to be heard. So I wouldn't want to just sort of be like, we need a communication strategy with our social, because I do think we have a really strong, like concrete, but, but maybe that is like, where are the places that we want us focus that concentration of our prioritization, right? Like, is it certain topics? Is it certain subgroups? Is it age ranges? Is it related to like, we're not reaching folks? Is that we're not reaching folks where they are? I don't, I just wouldn't, I just, I want to, I want to know a little bit more about that or like when we're talking about it, you know, have it be something sort of actionable that like, because mm -hmm. I do think the district does a very good mm -hmm. job. And the, I think the leadership at the schools also took yeah. action. The one A is the continuation of establishing our third priority. So I think you you might remember last summer we got really clear and very specific about the first two priorities, academics and um, social belonging, safety and wellness. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the time to get really clear and specific about what success looks like, what are our measurements mm -hmm. of implementation on around communications and community engagement. So that's what 1A okay. is, is to get that third priority to the same level of like concreteness okay. as those first two. And that would include not just our outbound communication, but also how how are we hearing and really using what, we're, what we are hearing from the oh, community. Thank you. There are echoes of what you were just saying. Yeah, there are echoes of what um, Tim was talking about before around the mm -hmm. community engagement in one and the, I can't remember what number it is, whatever, but the six, the engagement of parents supporting their kid, right? Engagement is, is, is a multiple way street, right? And so I think it's really important to not just understand how we are communicating out, but how we are bringing that communication back in and, and, and using that information. And so I do think it's worthwhile to, to, to dig into that. And like may, maybe some measurements and expectations around communication because let's be honest, you can have excellent communication and there are either people who don't pay attention and will scream about it or don't get their way and will scream about it. And sometimes if you just hear the screaming, the scream will be the communication that was terrible. And and I think sometimes there's a an impetus to respond to that and, and say, oh, we did something bad. How can we do something better? I mean, having some measurements around looking at you know, was the communication really terrible? Or do we just have a member of the public who had, who didn't read 17 emails or uh, did read 17 emails, but in the end got an answer they didn't like and therefore the, the process was followed. I mean, I, I think having some, some measurements around that, around our expectations would be helpful. And blind spots, I think, yeah. Jill, what you were talking like, if, if you are a community member who didn't have reliable internet or didn't have a job that required you to be exposed to email, would you have the same level of understanding of what was going on? Well, and as we have learned between 
a global pandemic and then a massive flood and all these things that we've all gone through as a community, there's not as bright a line of here's the school district and here's the community and here's this like so I don't know if community engagement might also be like talking to our the select board in Roxbury and our in our city council not familiar about housing and like here are some concrete things that are like yeah. like I know we lose teenagers and we lose state employees because they want to come here and they are willing to take a pay cut, but they cannot find a place to live. And so, like, it's part of it. Maybe this something more like a BSBA or something like that. But, like, there is a huge overlap. That is a very interconnected problem. I should probably be like, I shouldn't say this since I'm like volunteering to go to city council and like engage. <laughs> um, but that's something else that sort of comes to mind that I do think I don't want us to just be like, you know, there's, there's, there is some community and then people might, it's sort of a light bulb. It's like, oh, this is my, you know, my property taxes and housing and education are all, They're all intertwined. intertwined. Going back to the communication piece, I think this year we've done a much better job in terms of informing the community, which was really not great. I don't think before. I'm sure the school community knew what was going on, but you know, like I said before, as a person who is a grandparent but doesn't have kids in the school who has to read the emails and find the sports schedules and all that stuff, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of information about the school. And I I hope that we can keep up that level of communication, not just because we were in a, a, a budget crisis, you know, I think we really just have to like continue to get that information out there. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great point because I think there are, I think for our community members who do not have children in the schools, they do not get a lot of the communication that we get. And sometimes the communication they get is from places like Front Porch Forum, where the communication is to say generously uneven and sometimes yeah. unreliable. Sometimes unreliable. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and and I think we have to make sure that those community members are are informed of, of what we're doing. I mean, they obviously don't necessarily need to know that STARS testing is next week, but I think they need to know what we're considering budget wise and, and some of the you know the, the broader things that that impact them and their taxes and et cetera. I just wanted yeah. to say before we get too far into actually having any of these conversations, <laughs> um, did any, the next step is to determine what the biggest priorities are for the retreat. Um, so the, in order to be able to get, give Jim, Libby and me that input, does anybody feel like they need to better understand any of these number, any of these items here? Number two is quite big. Yeah. Number three is actually quite small yeah in my opinion so you know if somebody if we voted for three small things it might not take up four hours um so i don't know if you want to make a few bigger topics or something okay it i think could be like a... a communication heading with four subheadings you know where that is one of the communication things i don't know i think what i'd like to do is just leave them numbered as they are and then see where the votes shake out and then jim libby and i can figure out how much time do we think we need for certain so, certain yeah. items and then maybe there is like a we wouldn't call it like miscellaneous because none of these are actually miscellaneous but like maybe there's like a section of the meeting that's like quick yeah quicker things yeah why don't why don't we do this why don't we set up the um old monkey survey or google poll or whichever one we want to use mm -hmm. Uh, and then we'll have some space for comment so people can prioritize and then, yeah, and yeah. then give comment to, and then we'll look at it. And if something just naturally falls into place, we'll go with it. If it looks like we need to do a little rearranging, maybe we'll do like a couple, couple like agenda proposals and set that up for another, um, another poll, you know, for instance, we, yeah, we got a lot of suggestions to merge these three. So maybe the merger of these three and um and we can do it that way. Hey Jessica. Yeah. I think Jill had her hand up and I oh, also have sorry. Oh sorry, I 
think of your notes. So would I be voting for a 1A or 1B, or would it just be the numbers? I think just the numbers. Just the numbers. But then you could put comment and say, I, I voted for one, but <laughs> I, I think 1A is more important than 1B. I wonder if it makes sense to just kind of, yeah. I don't know if it's more work, but just at least as promises. We just all like articulate what our top four priorities are in our own words, so we're not kind of is that because it's kind of like your comments idea, and it's not too many to roll up. No, I think open ended questions are very difficult to interpret on a yeah. survey, and so I think an opportunity to provide open ended but but having um, yeah, defined criteria yeah. would be would be yeah more useful. I do want to, so we've got an outgoing student rep, we've got an incoming student rep, and we have a, a, a say where you are student rep. Uh, what what are we missing? Or are we missing anything uh, from your perspective? I had to figure some things out, like Robert's rules and board structure and there were like a solid couple months where I didn't know what MTSS meant and I was just really <laughs> confused. Um, but I don't know if that needs to be at this meeting. I think that now that I understand those things, that can be something that I can teach Imani, but. Maybe a refresher. Yeah, some of that, like stuff about how the board works and our policies and procedures is probably good. That would be helpful for, for new board members too. Yeah. Many trainings. Many moons ago, the equity committee, um, or at least a couple moons ago, the equity committee uh, had started to kind of draft the skeleton of a new board member onboarding packet of sorts. Um, so that is out there in terms of um, something that could be further filled out. I don't know by whom, but we do have that because I think it's a recognized need by by everybody that everybody kind of a lot of people come onto the board and and spend a good year sort of treading water and um, a bit confused. And that's not been a unique experience. The School Boards Association sends stuff in the mail, and I don't know if the student reps get it, but um, I've been reading it. Mm. It's really super helpful. I could bring in my stuff and you could borrow it if you don't get it, um, but it's very, it's pretty concise. Um, you know, it talks about like Robert's rules and, um, you know, other basic board functions. I also think the SBA is now doing a kind of monthly networking check-in for student members also. Um, I'll see if I can find a link to that and send that um, to you, Miriam and Amani. I wasn't sure if they were still meeting regularly, but I can check in on that. Brent, we should, yeah. Yeah, could you ask also add um to number nine role, role like what is our role oh, yeah. like the parameters of our mm -hmm. we can get that out in a couple of days yeah good to have folks chime in to see what rises to the top um, so our last item of business is uh, policy monitor C10 prevention of harassment, hazing, and bullying of students. Uh, do you have a motion to approve the C10 monitor report? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? So, was, oh, I just really quick yeah. question. Um, when did we, when was this first updated? I don't know, it says it somewhere, but. The policy itself? 
Oh, 2018. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. I forget it. I think I think I was gonna say a question, Libby, but I think you've asked answered it before about how like the progression, like how things are functioning now versus you know when the policy was was younger and it didn't work. But I, I feel like you've answered the question. But they're updated with along with the lawyer, right? I mean yeah. it's on here because somebody looked at it. Yeah. That's our role. And and the training we're going to have is is Heather Lynn's training on this because it's it's very helpful. It's a it's a tricky part of the law. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, before we adjourn, just want to congratulate Laura and all of the seniors on their pending graduation, which is going to happen before we meet next. But great work, everyone. Um, and a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone.